Well, hello, Stacy Murphy here. The first year I grew food, I think what scared me most was the potential for an onslaught of pests and diseases because it felt like there was really little control that I had over that. And, you know, I'm a take action kind of gal. And so it made me feel really uncomfortable to not know what to expect. And luckily for me, my first year was fairly pest and disease free, not out of anything I did. Uh, that just happened to be the case. And so all that worry was for nothing. And my second year growing food was totally different. All the pests and diseases, they found my crops, they affected my harvest, and it bummed me out. And what I now know is that you can't eliminate all pests and diseases from your growing space. They are a part of life and they are a part of the growing season. Uh, so the question is instead, are you doing everything you can to protect your crops and to get ahead of the life cycle of the pests and diseases? And who knows, there might be a bunch of pests and diseases that are on your site that are hatching as we speak and you're not sure what to look for and so you're not seeing the warning signs. And if you're like me and you want to harvest a whole bunch of healthy, pest-free food, you probably also don't want to spray any toxic chemicals or poisons on your plants. So I thought I would share with you my four-step pest and disease management process and also share an opportunity where you might be able to learn more about this from me as well. And I'm going to switch over to my slides now so you can follow along. So as I introduce my four-step pest and disease management process to you, uh, I want to keep an eye on the goal, which is basically healthy pest-free harvest without spraying toxins or poisons, which is otherwise stated as keeping pest populations low and managing diseases. And so we're not letting pests or diseases interfere with our harvest or with our enjoyment. And my pest and disease management process, this four-step process, is loosely correlated to the integrated pest and disease management systems that a lot of farmers use. And I've just simplified it for my purposes and wanted to share it with you today. So the first thing that I do is I'm basically observing and scouting for pests and diseases throughout the whole season. And the reason this is important is that seasonal data is is invaluable for your microclimate. Your microclimate is like no other. And the pests and diseases, uh, their populations, they tend to follow trends each year, which are related to the seasons, which are related to temperature. And so it'll be very specific to your growing space. And the wisdom of Mother Nature is pretty amazing. At 365 days from now, your space may be experiencing very similar conditions as it is now. And so by tracking and scouting pests in one year and throughout the whole growing season, you are smarter and wiser the next year from what might happen on that same day, 365 days from now. So that's essentially what you're doing. And when you're scouting and tracking pests, one thing to note is that I'm not recommending that you go out and count the number of insects that are on every plant because how in the world could you do this? If you were looking at this collard green and you were looking at these aphids, it would be next to impossible to count the number of aphids on that leaf and count all the aphids in your area and, and track the, the total number. So instead, what you want to do is figure out a way to quantify your observations. And if you're in a small space, uh, you know, less than a thousand square feet, you can look at all of your plants and, and, and I'll show you in a moment how to quantify, uh, your observation. But if you have a really large space, let's say you're on a farm, you have a quarter acre or an acre, you might want to zigzag through the center parts of the field and observe the pest populations of several plants as a sample size. So here's what I recommend for observing. So what you want to do is figure out a way to quantify the number of pests on your plants as a way to track whether or not that pest population is on the rise or on the fall. And so you want to give it a ranking number from one to 10. This is a way to quantify it. And so a one means that there are pests present. And here are just a couple of little aphids. A five would mean that you have enough aphids where it is starting to affect your harvest. And here you can see on this particular plant, lots of aphids. It would be um, a little bit challenging to wash all these off during harvest. And so if they might be chewing your plant and therefore it's affecting the, the harvest or there just may be so many of them that it's starting to get harder to harvest. So a five, that's what a five means, that it's affecting your harvest. 
And then here is a 10 where the plant is dying. And in this case, it looks like a bunch of caterpillar poop to me, which means that caterpillars have probably eaten all the leaves and it looks like they've eaten the center part of this plant. And when you have a kale or a collard plant, when a, when a caterpillar has eaten all the center of the plant, it's eaten all the new growth. And it potentially means that this plant will no longer uh, grow because there's no space for it to grow. There's no new growth coming out of this plant. So the plant is dying. So that's the ranking system from one being uh, some kind of pest is present to 10 the plant is dying. And you want to do this, I would say weekly, go for a quick uh, walk around your space and do a quick ranking for the different types of pests that are out there. And you can just keep a really simple log on hand and keep your notes really simple. What I recommend is some sort of timeline by week across the top and maybe mark what temperature uh, that each of those days are at its peak temperature. And you could also put low temperatures if you like, but typically pests start to come out with higher temperatures. So it's good to, to track how hot it's getting. And then below that, you want to have maybe a single line for each different type of pest and disease, and you can mark your ranking per week. And if you don't have a ranking for a particular crop, you can either write in a zero or, or you can just leave it blank. And then if you do anything to that particular crop to help uh, reduce the pest population, then you can make a little symbol maybe and then have a little key that says what those different symbols mean. And here with leaf miners, I'm removing some of the leaves in order to keep the pest population under control. And with the aphids, I might be applying some sort of foliar spray when they start to get out of hand. So now that you have this tracking of each week, what's really cool is you start to find patterns. So basically what you can do is you can enter all your data into some sort of spreadsheet like the one you see here, or you can just keep your log as it is and just notice the trends there. And and then what you can do is color code it if you like, and anything above a five starts, five starts to become red, anything at a three starts to become yellow. So those are moments when those pest populations are ramping up and you wanna start doing something about it because you don't wanna risk the failure of the crop. And so you wanna, before you get above a five, you wanna start to do something. So this is really valuable because now next year, you can take a look at this and you can say, oh, well next year I gotta start being aware of those flea beetles in May before they start ramping up, or I need to be ahead of that squash vine borer before that starts to ramp up. So these patterns can be really useful if you are using a similar crop plan next year, planting dates that are similar, you know that you want to avoid certain planting dates based on when your pest population is ramping up as well. So this is all really useful data. And it starts to tell us a little bit about the insect life cycle, right? And while we, while we might know that the insect life cycle of a beneficial ladybug is three to six weeks and the swallowtail maybe three to eight weeks, we can actually start to see it on our calendar when exactly it starts to ramp up. So we, you know, just knowing the life cycle of the insect doesn't tell us at what temperature that particular uh, insect starts to ramp up production. But the data for our particular microclimate will give us that data. So that's the first step in my process, and uh, I really recommend it. Okay, so step two, and this is a really big step two, is that you want to create a plan for interrupting life cycles of pests and diseases. And first, of course, you have to know what you're looking for. And so you're going to want to learn how to identify pests and diseases and, and what kind of symptoms appear on the plants. And symptoms could be very widespread. So you might have tunnels, you might see eggs, you might see caterpillars, moths, you might see chew marks, or it might look like rust on the plant, wilt, shrinkage, leaf curl, spots, uh, the list goes on and on. There's lots of things to look for. So you want to start to be able to identify what kind of symptoms are a marker for different pests and diseases. So that's the first part. And then the next stage of this, uh, of this step is to start to interrupt the cycles of that pest or disease. And so to do that, you can do preventative strategies. Um, and these are things that boost the health of the soil and the plants, and therefore, uh, hopefully your plant won't get the pest or disease. Uh, you know, we are, when you look at humans, there might be a room full of humans, and some might get a particular disease, and some might not. It has to do with their immunity system. So 
what I found is that an ounce of prevention is worth dozens of pounds of harvested produce. And so one such preventative strategy is to intercrop, uh, which would uh, basically invite in beneficial insects potentially, uh, or even deter pests from your space. So that's just one preventative strategies. And there are dozens of preventative strategies that you can use in your growing space. And the next part of creating a plan uh, for interrupting life cycles is that you want to put in place some mechanical controls. So these are physical things, and I call this fighting with your bare hands. So you're physically trying to either squish or remove a bug, uh, maybe trap it, produce a kind of barrier between your crop and the pest or some kind of lure. And one of the most famous lures is the beer trap uh, for slugs. It definitely works if you have that lip right about soil level, level those slugs will crawl in. They like that yeasty, sugary uh, material. And the one trick here is that you want to go out into the garden and, and pull them out in the early morning. Otherwise, they will just crawl back out of that beer and they will go back to chewing on your plants. Uh, the next part of the plan is to put in place biological controls. So we talked about prevention and then mechanical controls as being the least invasive methods to get rid of pests and diseases. So now we're talking about biological controls. And this is where you bring on the bug war and you want to invite beneficials, insects into your growing space. And you can do this by... Um, by planting a lot of habitat for them, such as small flowering uh, crops in the mint family. Um, you can put in small flowering crops from the daisy family as well. And those things will bring in those beneficials who will start to uh, chew up your pests. And then another part of the plan as a last resort is a chemical control. And these are things, these are organic sprays and dusts that you basically spray onto the plants or apply to the plants or apply to the soil. And the reason why this is a last resort is that these things can negatively affect beneficial insects. And so these are things like uh, neem oil and um, pyrethrum, and then also homemade remedies that you can make from household items as well. And all of these can have a negative effect on beneficials. So we use them as a last resort. They have a high impact when you have a really high pest population. They definitely are the right way to go. They will, they will knock that pest population down, but you also knock down the beneficial insect population. So that's step two. You've got your four pieces, prevention, mechanical control, biological control, and then chemical control in order of use. And then the third step of my process is to basically evaluate how well your plan worked and all of your strategies, how did they pay off? And so going through and looking at, did you save your crop or was it, uh, did you did you invest a whole lot of money and time in a particular strategy and you lost the crop anyway? That would mean you don't want to do that strategy ever again. So you're going to evaluate how well your strategies paid off. And the fourth and final step is to incorporate your lessons learned into next year. So you want to take a look at your tracking log that you created, look at when those pest populations are ramping up, and uh, you're going to decide what kind of preventative measures you're going to take just before those pest populations ramp up, keeping in mind the strategies that you put in place this year and whether or not they were effective or not, and whether or not you want to incorporate them again next year. All right, so if you found this useful and you want to dive deeper into this four-step process and learn to identify all the pests and diseases and learn what kind of controls are used for all the different pests and diseases and when to interrupt those life cycles and with what kind of homemade recipes, you can join me in a two-part video series, which also includes worksheets and a live Q&A. And at the bottom of your screen there is a link to the webpage where you can find all of that information. All right, thanks for tuning in. I'll see you next time.